uh, study lessons that are handed out uh, after each presentation, as well as the note sheet for during the lecture. Uh, those are available at the resource table here in the back of, of the room. And I uh, want to encourage you to keep filling out the back of that uh, study guide and turning it in. That's the way, that's your ticket to getting the uh, DVDs of the presentation. So I want to remind you of that and uh, just mention that uh, we are back here tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. And that is for Revelation's Last Trumpet. We're here again Sunday evening at 7 p.m., Revelation's Hellfire. So I want to encourage you, if you have friends or family, it's not too late to invite them out. And uh, just wanted to see, did anyone bring a guest with new, like tonight's the first night you brought someone different with you. Anyone bring a guest with them this evening? Very good. All right. So does any, has anyone brought more than one guest with them new this evening? All right. So we have, do we have two that have brought a guest this evening? We have a tie for a guest. All right. Well, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. All right, give them a hand because they just uh, received this resource. But we have a tie. We have a tie. So um, here's how we'll do it. If, if both of you are interested in the strongest strongs, uh, one of you would be willing to wait. We'll, we'll bring one tomorrow evening. Otherwise, otherwise um, the other option would be Eight Secrets to Ancient Health, if anyone was interested in that. So strongest strongs or Eight Secrets to Ancient Health. You'll wait on the strongest strongs? All right. You guys want to wait so we can give it, give it over here? All right. Well, give them a hand. Good job. Now, now since, we're, since we're bringing the strongest strongs back tomorrow night, we might as well bring an extra one. And if you can bring more than one person, that resource would be available to you. What an incredible resource to study God's Word. I don't know if everyone is familiar, I'm sure most of you are, but just to mention, um, a, an exhaustive concordance works like a dictionary. You would look up a word. Amazing. How, I don't know how long it would have taken to put, together, put that together, but you can look up a word, and it will tell you every single place in the entire Bible where that word is used. What a resource. And so, uh, again, welcome. Uh, take a moment as we uh, welcome up our speaker. Turn to someone next to you. If you've sat in the same place and you know everybody around you, it'll just be greeting someone you know. But if you're near someone that you don't know, tell them your name, say hello, and uh, we're going to welcome up our speaker tonight. 68? Wow. That's impressive. Well, I, too, want to welcome you, and thanks for coming back. Sometimes we take a couple of nights off. You know, it's, it's kind of a catch-22 because if we, if we go so many nights, it kind of wears people out. But if you take a few nights off, it kind of breaks up the momentum. So I'm glad that you all remembered and came back out tonight. Okay, now we aren't going to do a quiz on the other night's topic because it was really a, a heavy topic, and I uh, want to move on to something else tonight. But I do want to answer some questions. Now, two questions came in. And uh, they text them to me, and so I'm going to try to remember, re remember them at the top, top of my head. One of them was, is the Antichrist here right now, or is the Antichrist a person? I think it was something like that. And the answer is, yes, the Antichrist is here right now. And the Bible prophecy has talked about that. You trace back the history of many of these great leaders of these churches around here, and they all taught and believed the same thing on this. And is the Antichrist a person? It's a position. But a person holds that position. And so that person can change, but the position is the same. That has taken the place of Christ and is not biblical. That is the Antichrist position. And we talked about that. And then the other question is, um, basically, if somebody gets the mark of the beast, can they be saved? And the answer is no. At the very end of time, there's going to be two groups, right? Those who get the seal of God and those who get the mark of the beast. And once you get the mark of the beast, you are lost. Once you get the seal of God, you are eternally saved. And so we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks, the mark of the beast and the seal of God. Now let me answer some other questions that have come in from time to time as I've done uh, seminars. This one, when we die, is it simply because our time has come? Now a lot of people have that question. They say, you know, somebody dies and they try to comfort them and say, well, their time has come. Well, that might be the case. It, it could possibly be. But I want to give you a couple Bible verses here. Here's Ecclesiastes 7, verse 17. It says this. Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. 
Why should you die before your time? So you get that? We can do things, make choices that would actually cut our time short. Now, let me just give you kind of a cute little example here. I'm not big on amusement parks, and we don't go to a lot of amusement parks, but uh, a couple weeks ago we were in Gatlinburg, and my daughter wanted to go to Dollywood, and so we took her to Dollywood, and my daughter wants to get on these rides. Now, I do not like these rides. I don't like heights. It scares me to death. But she says, Dad, come on. You know, it's so boring. You know, she's an only child. If I go on them by myself, it's not fun. So guess who has to bite the bullet and do it, all right? Dear old dad does. So she wanted to go on one of these deals that it was wide open, all right? It wasn't inside of a building that go way, way up, several stories. I mean, really, really high. And basically, you just kind of have a seat belt up on you like this. And so I thought, okay, I'll try this one. So this thing takes you slowly up, right, like this. And I'm just hanging there. My legs are dangling, and I'm like, Lord, if you get me off safely this thing, you won't ever have to answer this prayer again because I'm never getting back on one of these things in my life. Well, then all of a sudden they just drop you straight down, you know. Anyways, so that's just kind of a cute example. But we can make decisions. We can make foolish choices that perhaps would cut our life short. You know, you drink and drive, and you are really rolling the dice. You see what I'm saying here, everybody? It also says, bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. So we can make some choices that would cut our life short. All right, the next one is, now, this has to do with tonight's topic, and it's a very important question. The question is, what is dispensationalism? Now, perhaps many of you have never heard of the word dispensationalism before, but probably everybody in here has been affected by this teaching in one way or another. Now, here's my little definition of dispensationalism. It's this. It's a biblical interpretation that suggests God's plan of salvation was different during various time periods. So, in other words, dispensationalists believe that in the Old Testament, people were saved differently than we are saved now in the New Testament. Now, let me give you an example. This is kind of a, now there's different models of dispensation, but this one right here is just kind of a classic example. So, for example, they believed in the days of Abraham. Abraham was saved by promise. Then once Moses came and the children of Israel, that God's people were saved by keeping the law, right? So they meticulously kept the law and therefore they had salvation. But now they say in the New Testament, we are saved by grace through faith. They believe there's going to be a rapture followed by a seven-year period. We're going to talk a little about that tonight. But uh, is this biblical? Now, I want you to notice what the Bible says here in Hebrews chapter 4. Now, this is the New Testament, and probably this is Paul writing. But this is the New Testament, and I want you to notice what the Bible writer says. For indeed the, can you say that word with me, everybody? The gospel was preached to us. Now, when he says preached to us, he's talking about us New Testament. So the gospel was preached to us. We understand the gospel. And then he goes on to say, as well as to them. Now, who's the them? He's talking in the context of the Jews entering Canaan. So my friends, see, the Jews understood the gospel. And when, when they brought those lambs for sacrifices, they were not saved by doing the act of killing that thing. They were saved by faith in what that lamb represented. See, when they killed that lamb, it pointed forward to Jesus dying on the cross. They knew that the Messiah was going to come and die for their sins. So in faith, they were looking forward to Christ. Now, you and I, we weren't there when Christ died, but in faith, you and I look back on the cross. But everybody is going to heaven by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, here's Galatians 3, verse 8. Notice what it says here. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham. See, Abraham understood the gospel. He didn't know Christ. I mean, he knew about that Christ would come, but he, he saw it looking forward, and he had faith in it. Now, here's a very powerful verse in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 6. It's almost like the central verse in the entire book. It says this, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach. The everlasting gospel, the gospel that has always existed. So let me give you a conversation that is not going to take place in heaven. So let's say by the grace of God, I make it to heaven and I'm walking down those streets of gold one day and another fellow's coming at me, walking towards me. And of course, everybody's friendly and nice in heaven. We stop and chit chat a little bit and shake hands. And he asked me who I am and what time period did I live in? And I said, well, I lived in the 20th and the 21st century. And he said, well, how did you get here? And I said, well, I got here by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And then, of course, everybody's reciprocal and nice in heaven. So I say, well, what's your name and what time period did you live in? And he said, well, my name is so-and-so, and I lived during the time of King David. And I say to him, well, how did you get here? And he says, I got here by my works. I worked myself here, and I did everything so meticulously that the Lord saved me. My friends, that conversation will never take place because everybody who gets to heaven is going by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Can you say amen to that, everybody? All right, so this idea of dispensationalism is simply not biblical in that regards. Now, let's go into the next question. 
this is a very important question. You're going to see how important this question is as we look at some controversial issues over the next few nights. What was Jesus' method of Bible study? Okay, so if Jesus had a method of Bible study, that would be the, the method of Bible study you and I would want to use, right? Now, if you remember in the Gospel account, after Jesus ra was raised from the dead, he started to appear to different people, and word started to spread around, Christ is risen, right? Well, there was two discouraged disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, and Christ came up to them and began to talk with them. Now, they didn't know it was Jesus, and so he begins to talk to them, and he begins to give them a Bible study. And the Bible tells us how he gave them a Bible study. It says this, Luke 24, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, there's several principles that we can draw from this, but I want to share with you three here as we uh, close down our questions and answers. First of all, what do we see there? We see that in order to understand the word of God, you and I need to be Christ-dependent. Now, we talked about this the other day. Christ is now in heaven, and who did he send as his representative? The Holy Spirit. So in other words, we need to be Christ-dependent or Holy Spirit-dependent for you and I to understand the Word of God. That's number one. Number two is we want to do a chrono chronological study. The Bible says he began with Moses, right? That's number two. We're going to go through these one at a time. And then number three is a comprehensive interpretation. The Bible says he used all of the Scriptures, all right? So let's look at these one at a time. Okay, so first of all, we need to be Christ-dependent when we study the Word of God. So it says this in verse 15. Remember, they're walking along the road. They're discouraged. And it says, so while it was, so, so it was, while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So that's what we want. When we study the Word of God, we want the Holy Spirit to draw near to us. Now, here's the question I have for you. Why didn't Jesus, after he was resurrected, why didn't he show up to Caiaphas? You know, the, Caiaphas was the high priest who had him crucified. He could have showed up to Caiaphas, Caiaphas saw him die on the cross. He could have showed up there and he could have showed his nail-pierced hands, could have shown the wounds on his back and stuff, said, hey, look, me, I'm resurrected now. Would Caiaphas have believed if Jesus would have done that, you think? No, absolutely not. Because Caiaphas was so convinced and so set in his ways, there's no miracle that Jesus could have done that could have convinced that man that he was wrong. Now, that's why Jesus drew near to these two humble disciples. Now, I want to share with you a very important principle in Holy Scripture. Psalm 25, verse 9 says this, The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. Who gets taught here, everybody? The humble, right? So if we have a lot of pride, we have a lot of arrogance, we have a lot of preconceived ideas, oftentimes the Holy Spirit can't reach us. So we must come to the Word of God with humility and ask the Lord in humility to teach us His Scripture. Now, notice what 1 Peter 1, verse 21 says. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit inspired these men like John and Daniel to write these books. So if it inspired them to write it, whose help do we need to understand it, everybody? We need the Holy Spirit, okay? So now here, let me give you a little prayer. When you open the Word of God, here's a good prayer to pray. It's Psalm 86, verse 11. It says this, Teach me your way, O Lord, right? That's what we all want to know. We want to know God's will for our lives, especially His will as revealed in His Word. Teach me your way, O Lord. But there's a little condition here. When God teaches us, then it says this, I will walk in your truth. So when God reveals truth to us, my friends, it's a privilege, it's an honor. And then he wants us to walk in it. Can you say amen to that, everybody? So we want to be taught by the Holy Spirit and God to teach us his will out of his word. Okay, the second thing that we notice, what Jesus did in his Bible study, is he began with Moses. Here's what the scripture says. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Now, let me tell you, I heard a minister say this one time, and I agree with him, that Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 11, those first 11 chapters in Genesis, are some of the most important chapters in the Bible. As a matter of fact, this minister said that there's no major teaching in Scripture, other places in Scripture, that you cannot trace back first to those chapters. You see what I'm saying? So when you do a Bible study, one of the things that you want to do is see how it was in the beginning and understand that very clearly how it was in the beginning and then move forward with your Bible study. It will help you tremendously. Now notice this. Here's an example. I could give you a couple of them. When people came and asked Jesus questions, notice what it says here. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning, goes back to the book of Genesis, made them male and female? So this is very helpful for you and I to go back to how it was in the beginning 
bef- when we're studying a particular subject. And then lastly, when we're studying the Bible and we're studying a controversial subject, we want to do a comprehensive interpretation. We want to use all of Scripture. And that's why Pastor Clark really likes that concordance. A concordance helps you do that. Now, notice what the Bible says here. And beginning at Moses, Jesus, uh, at the beginning at Moses, Jesus' Bible study, remember? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in how much of the Scriptures, everybody? Okay, all the Scriptures. So he started in Genesis, he laid the foundation there, and then he went to the rest of Scriptures. And so we want to use the entire Bible. Like, let me just give you a little simple example of this. Let's say that you were wanting to do a Bible study on prayer. And you were want to find out what does the Bible teach on prayer. Well, if you just picked out one verse out of the Bible, you could kind of get confused on prayer. Let me give you an example of this. In John, in John chapter 14, Jesus said, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, how could somebody get confused on that? How about if I say, Lord, I see the lottery's up to, I don't see what it was, I don't watch that, but I mean, you, when you drive in, we've all seen that billboard, you know, and we think, what would happen if I lose that? Probably lose my hold on God. But anyways, we, we say, Lord, I want to win that lottery, and I claim it in Jesus' name. Well, the Bible says he'll ask, answer anything if you ask in his name. How come he doesn't answer that request? Because then if you look in the book of James, it says you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss. In other words, you're asking for something that God knows could destroy you. And so he's not going to answer that prayer. And so we want to take what Scripture says as a whole on a subject. Can you say amen to that, everybody? And that's what we're going to do uh, over the next few nights. Now, by the way, so tomorrow night, we have a very important subject. One of those subjects you just do not want to miss. It's called Revelation's Last Trumpet. And then on Sunday night is kind of part two of that. We're going to talk about Revelation's Hellfire. And then on Monday, no meeting. And then on Tuesday is the Millennium, the Revelation's Millennium. That's a very important lecture. Now, let me share this with you. So what we're going to do from tonight all the way down to Tuesday night is we're going to talk about from the time that Jesus comes to all the way down to the end of the millennium, the key things that happen within that time period. So that's the next four nights. And then next Thursday night, we're back here, and the topic is we have to do a Thursday night. I have a church camp out, and so I can't be here next Friday night. But next Thursday night will be the next meeting, and it's how not to get the mark of the beast. And I promise you, my friends, you come that night, and by the grace of God, you implement what the Scripture says, and you will not get the mark of the beast. So Thursday night, how not to get the mark of the beast. Okay, Pastor Clark, let's do our little gift drawing here. We've got three options, and so if you win, you can pick one of these options. I got a little DVD called The Daniel Chronicles. It goes through a very important prophecy in the book of Daniel. The other one is called The Appearing by Pastor Sean Boudstra, an excellent, excellent book. And the other one is called The Antichrist Agenda. Thank you. All right, the last three are 445. 445. Okay, good. Which one would you like? Oops, I threw that one back in. All right, uh, and then this one is 442. 442. 442. I need you back up here, Pastor Clark, because somebody's either shy or doesn't want a book. It's a nobody. It's a, it's a dead ticket. Okay. 457. 457. Okay, good for you. Here we go. Ooh, got some readers here. I thought somebody would jump on that DVD. All right, tonight's subject's a very important one, and it's entitled Revelation's Rapture, What Really Happens at the Second Coming of Christ. And I want to begin with a little illustration. I want you to imagine that you are on an overnight flight from Washington Dulles Airport over to Germany. And I've been on a flight like that before. And as you take off there at Dulles, from Dulles Airport, if you've ever been over to Europe before, you take off and you kind of hug the East Coast up into Canada and then cross the Atlantic up kind of on the top of the part of the Atlantic Ocean. And as you're over the ocean now, several hours have passed, you've been chit-chatting with the person next to you, but that conversation runs dry. And before you know it, you've fallen asleep. And uh, you fell asleep, you've been asleep for about an hour and a half, you wake up, you look at your watch, And you kind of stretch out a little bit, and you notice the person next to you is gone. But something very strange has happened. They're they're gone, but their clothes are there, their glasses are there, their wallet's there, their belt is there, and you think to yourself, what in the world is going on? And you begin to look around the plane a little bit, and you see that a once completely full plane, there are several people missing. 
And all of a sudden, a frantic mother screams from the back of the plane. She's screaming, where is my daughter? And the stewardess are going up and down the airplane trying to find these people. And finally, the pilot decides to turn around and head back to Dulles. And as you land in Dulles, you go to the terminal and you go to the television over there and you see that this type of thing has happened all over the world. Pilots who have been in planes, the planes have crashed because the pilots have disappeared. People going 60 miles down the highway have disappeared and their cars have gone into adjacent lanes and killed people. And everybody is wondering, where did these people go? Well, all of this and much, much more in the biggest selling Christian fiction series of all time, the Left Behind series. Now, how many of you have ever read the book or seen the movie? Can I see your hands? Okay, a number of you have. Now, if you listen to Trinity Broadcasting Network or Daystar or Moody Radio, their their, uh, biblical interpretation is going to be along those lines, something like I just described. Now, most people realize that the books and the movie, the storyline behind them is fiction. But what they believe is that the theology in these books is spot on. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Now here's kind of a nutshell of what the rapture theory, some call it a secret rapture, other people just call it a rapture. The secret rapture and left behind teaches the following. Number one is Jesus is coming to rapture Christians. Number two, the belief is once the Christian church is out of the way, God reestablishes his covenant with the Jews. That's why there is so much attention on Israel. If you watch Trinity or Daystar, they're really, really focused on Israel a lot because they believe that Christians are going to be raptured out of the way and then God is going to work through the Jews again. Number three, they believe that those left behind have a second chance at salvation. And number four, they believe that shortly after the rapture, a seven-year period begins in which the Antichrist will make a covenant with the Jews and then break it. The Antichrist will then cause major persecution on earth known as the tribulation. So I, I, I made this little model here so you can kind of understand what the belief is. So the belief is that Jesus is going to come rapture his people. And then there's a three and a half year period where the Antichrist comes. And at first he's a good guy in their theology. He makes a covenant with the Jews. He rebuilds the temple. But then he breaks that covenant. And then the last three and a half years you had the mark of the beast, the tribulation, the plagues. And then they believe that there's like a third coming of Christ. But what we're going to see tonight, my friends, is that this model right here is nowhere found in Scripture at all. It is not in the Bible whatsoever. And I challenge you to find where there is a seven-year period in the book of Revelation, all right? And uh, if you want to know where they kind of pull this seven-year period off of a prophecy that has nothing to do with this, I can show you that where that is. But there's no seven-year period at all mentioned in Scripture. Now, this is what the Bible does teach. The, there's no time period mentioned. The Bible teaches that there's an increase in immorality, which triggers natural disasters, and that causes the mark of the beast, tribulation, and plagues, and then you have what's called the second coming of Christ. There's no rapture, and then seven years later, a third third coming of Christ. The Bible always always talks about the second coming of Christ, or the the coming of Christ. And this is the long-standing Christian position. This, we're going to see tonight, is relatively new, really almost 150 years old. It came into the Christian church. So here's the points that we're going to look at tonight. Number one is, is this here, this left behind theology, is it biblical? Number two is, is this a dangerous teaching? And number three, we're going to talk about where did this teaching come from, okay? Now, before I get into the the Bible, I want to give you a little testimony here. There was a pastor. His name was Ronald Bingham, and he was a pastor of a large church. And one day his wife came into his office and she said, Honey, I have to teach the second coming to my Sunday school class tomorrow. I've been hunting for proof of the secret rapture, but I can't seem to find it. You've preached about it often. Will you please help me find these texts? And so you know how men are. Some her reply to him. She says, But I've been reading that, and it's about the noisiest thing I can find in the Bible. Now notice what this pastor says. It's reported in the book Rapture, Resurrection by this here. Though the Bible never seems to refer to it directly. Now, that's a shocking statement from a man who really promoted and pushed this theology. So let's go back to McGavern here. He says this, Let us here emphasize that it is to us a most amazing fact that there is positively not one passage of Scripture which teaches or even hints at a secret coming of Christ without the aid of much inference, interpolation, supposition, addition, and deletion. What is he saying here? I like this little illustration. Like, uh, you see the sign here? It says, Bible studies at 7 o'clock. Bring your Bible and bring your scissors. Because in order to bring, believe this theology, here's what you need to do. And I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to belittle anybody. I'm just telling you the plain facts. You've got to take a little kind of clause out of a sentence and cut it out and paste it over here. Then take a little clause of, of a sentence out and paste it over here. It is nowhere in Scripture. 
this seven-year period where all this stuff is supposed to take place, it is simply not in Holy Scripture. Now, I can tell you that I've had PhDs who believe this. I've had even had authors of books that believe in this come to these meetings, and I've said to them, show me where this is clearly taught in Scripture, and not one of them can. Okay? It is not in the Word of God. Now, here's, let's, let's look at some facts, what the Bible says about the coming of Christ. Will Jesus secretly rapture Christians? So here's the points that we're going to look at, what the Bible tells us about Christ's coming. First of all, we're going to notice it's going to be a visible event. Now, what does visible mean, everybody? You're going to be able to see it, okay? So let's look at some scriptures. Now, notice the Bible doesn't differentiate between a rapture and a third coming of Christ. It's all talking about the same event, the coming of Christ. It says this in verse 7, A man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. So notice this right here. It's not only believers who will see him when he comes. When Christ comes a second time, every single person is going to see him. Now, notice how many verses I'm using to show this. But here's an excellent verse on the subject. Now, if you remember, when Christ rose from the dead, he went to heaven briefly. The Father accepted his sacrifice. And then Christ actually came down and was on earth for 40 days, the Bible tells us. And then when Jesus met with his disciples one last time, the Bible says he simply floated up out of their presence. Now, that must have been something to see, right? So he just simply floated right out of the atmosphere. Now, if I were there, I would have done just what the disciples did. You know what they did? They stood around and they were just kind of like this, wondering what's going to happen next. And then all of a sudden, two angels draw near to them, and they basically said, these angels said to them, hey, listen, didn't he give you guys some instructions to do? But then they said this to him, to the disciples. This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Ooh, that was neat, wasn't it? All right, so a real Christ ascended, and a real Christ is going to send. They saw him ascend into heaven, we will see him descend. Okay, is everybody clear on that? All right, here's another one. Matthew 24, verse 27. Now, by the way, many of these verses are verses that people use to say that it's going to be a rapture or a secret rapture. It says, For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, I'll tell you, uh, when I first started ministry, I started in New Mexico. And uh, right down by the border of Mexico, and um, I'd never lived in the west and, and that part of the country before and it's a higher level elevation and they don't have much rain there but when it rains it brings you to your knees i mean they don't even have sewer systems there because it doesn't rain that much but uh, the water can accumulate very quickly and uh sometimes the lightning storms were so intense you could actually feel your hair start standing up on your arm anybody ever had that experience before it's pretty kind of humbling isn't it well <clears throat> i'll tell you my wife when we in our bedroom she does not like any light whatsoever there cannot be any light showing and we she bought these really thick curtains and not only that but i'm the type of person i cannot sleep unless i have something on my head Okay, so I usually, I sleep with a pillow on my head. Anybody else a pillow sleeper with, on their head? Okay, I do. If I don't have a pillow, I'll just take a shirt off or something and wrap it around my head. I just have to sleep that way. So in New Mexico, when this lightning was flashing with that thick curtain, and I got this pillow on my head, I could still see the lightning coming through. And the Bible says when Christ comes, it's going to be like a lightning flashing across the sky. Everybody's going to recognize that something's, something's taking place. The Bible says this, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. The Bible is very clear on this subject. When Christ comes, we are going to be able to see it. Can you say amen to that, everybody? All right, number two, write this down. Jesus will not come back alone. Who's coming back with Jesus when he comes? Does anybody know? Okay, the angels. Very good. Notice what the Scripture says here. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. Now, just think about how many angels that is. Daniel says there's... 10,000 times 10,000s and thousands of thousands. If you take that literally, that's millions of angels, right? So all these angels are coming back. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it looks like clouds coming with them because there's so many bright, white, and glowing angels, and they're all coming back when Christ comes, all right? Now, let me give you another conversation that will not take place. Let's just say that I'm in my office in New Albany, and my wife's at our home in Charlestown, and she calls me up, and she says, Honey, I just saw on the TV that Jesus came. Now, it might be a false Messiah that does that, but I'll tell you, the, when Jesus comes and he enters into this atmosphere with his holy angels, there's going to be a climactic explosion. 
and everybody on earth is going to know that something very significant is taking place. That conversation is not going to happen when the true Christ comes. Everybody's going to know. Okay, now notice this verse right here. This is a very important verse. Matthew 24, verse 31, it says, And he will send his angels with a great sound of a what, everybody? Now, I want you to notice this trumpet is mentioned over and over. So we're going to come back to this, this trumpet, but notice all these verses it's mentioned. Okay, so put that in the back of your mind. So he'll send his angels the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. Okay, so the angels are coming back, and they're going to gather his people, and they're going to be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. All right, number three, Christ's second coming is going to be an audible event. Now, what does audible mean, everybody? Okay, you can hear it. Very good. So here's 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 again. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a what, everybody? Okay, shout. Now let me pause and tell you a shouting story. Um, years ago, when I was 17 years of age, I went into the airport for the first time. Never been in an airport before. And that was in the days where you could walk right up to where the plane led off. You remember those days, pre-9-11? And we were going there to pick up my best friend who was playing professional baseball for the Minnesota Twins. And so we were excited to see him. He was a grade older than me, but he was my best friend. And so we had to pass through this metal detector, and I'd never done that before. And so as I passed through, I said to my friend Troy up in front of me, I said, hey, Troy, I snuck that gun in, didn't I? And now, you know, being an arrogant 17-year-old, my hat flipped back there, backwards. Now, have you ever said something? that you didn't know it was really wrong, but after you said it, you just thought to yourself, I probably shouldn't have said that, right? That was one of those moments. And so I begin to walk, and the lady who's manning the metal detector, she begins to shout at me. And at first she's yelling kind of like, hey, stop. And I just thought, oh, no, this isn't happening. So I just kept walking. And she begins to shout louder and louder. And there was three security guards up the, up the hallway, and she begins to shout at them. Pretty soon everybody in that hallway is looking at me. My face is beat red. And she yells at them. She says, hey, grab that guy. He says he's got a gun. So they grab me, throw me up against the wall, frisk me, and they kick me out of the airport. wasn't my proudest moment in my life. But let me tell you this. When that woman was shouting at me, there was no confusing that, okay? That's what not... Uh, uh, that's, there's, there's no biblical evidence that this thing is going to be secret at all. So there it is. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the, what's the next word, everybody? There's that trumpet again. The trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So we've got shouting, voice of an archangel, trumpet of God, dead people coming out of the ground. This is how the Bible describes the coming of Christ, all right? All right, let's go on. So here's that verse again. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Now, I'm going to talk about the thief here in just a moment because people says, yeah, the rapture, Jesus comes in like a thief and snatches his people and takes them off. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Now, let me ask you this. Does this, this sound like to you that there is a seven-year period after the coming of Christ? He comes like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare or destroyed. No, we're going to see the earth is in an absolutely uh, convulsed and, and a state where no human being could live on it after Christ comes. All right, so, uh, but the thing I wanted you to notice here is, is the heavens will disappear with a roar, okay? All right, number four. The righteous living are caught up to meet Jesus in the air. The righteous living are caught up to meet Jesus in the air when he comes. Now, wouldn't that be a privilege to be alive when Christ comes? You know, so many people have been waiting for it, and they have went to the graves, you know. But it would be such a privilege to be alive. But, of course, if you are alive, then you have to go through this tribulation mark of the beast thing. And so it's kind of like a, a mixed bag if you really want to do it or not, right? But if God wants us to do it, we, we, we would do it, right? So the righteous living are caught up. So we already learned. But the first thing that happens to the righteous, the righteous dead come up out of the graves, right? That's here at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I've got to tell you one more story before we move on, okay? But keep this in the back of your mind. We're talking about the righteous living being caught up to meet the Lord. But let, listen to this story. Years ago, I was doing meetings like this in New Mexico, and there was a young man who was coming to the meetings, and he was just a few years older than me. I was in my late 20s. He was in his early 30s. And uh, he believed in this whole rapture seven-year period. And we got along great. You know, I don't argue and fight with people. And he and I were just, just really got along well, even though we disagreed on this. So he listened to the lecture, like you're doing tonight. And he had some friends 
at Trinity Broadcasting Network, and he called them up and he said, hey, there's this minister over here that's saying there's no such thing as a rapture followed by this seven-year period. Give me some Bible verses to show him that he's wrong. Okay, so that's what he did, unbeknownst to me. So the next night we had a meeting. He comes trotting down the center aisle, and he had a great big smile on his face. And he told me what I just told you about him calling Trinity Broadcasting Network. And he flopped his Bible open. He says, right here is the verse. This is proof that there's this rapture filed by the seven-year period. And he showed me the Bible, and he had this thing underlined. He had it highlighted. He had it starred, okay? And uh, I looked down at the verse that he had to prove this theory. And you know what verse it was for everybody? It was this one right here. This is the Lynch pin passage that people use to say there's this rapture, secret rapture, seven-year period. This is it right here. And I looked at it, and I looked up at his face to make sure he wasn't joking, and I read it very slowly to him. I said, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I said to him, my friends, what about this? identifies a secret rapture in any way, shape, or form. And you should have seen how confused he was. And I learned something that night that I've seen many times. I've even seen it in my own life. And you know what that is? That when you've been taught wrong on something, particularly religious matters, oftentimes we just develop this pride in our heart and we're not willing to humble ourselves and go back to the Word of God and say, Lord, what does your Word really say on this? You know one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible says, You shall seek me when you search with me. You shall find me when you search with me with how much of your heart, everybody. It's an all heart type of thing. And when these confusing subjects come up, you and I get down on our knees and say, Lord, show me your truths. I don't want to be deceived. There's going to be a lot of deception here at the end of time. What does your Bible teach on this subject? And go through and look up these passages and the Holy Spirit will speak to you. Okay, I chased a little rabbit there. Let's get back on track. So the Bible says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then the very next verse says, then... After the dead in Christ rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And what a beautiful day that's going to be when the dead and the living are reconnected. You know, this last two years, I've probably done about eight funerals, and I'm getting tired of them, right? But on this day, it's going to be what a beautiful, beautiful day when the the dead and the living are reconnected for eternity, okay? Number five, write this down at the coming of Christ. The Bible tells us that all of the saved will be changed. All of the saved will be changed. Here's a beautiful verse in 1 Corinthians. Actually, I just read this at a funeral yesterday. It says this, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall all be what, everybody? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. See, there's that trumpet again. Remember, we keep talking about that. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible body must put on incorruption, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When does that happen? It happens at the coming of Christ. Now, let me give you a little illustration here. Years ago, I was with a group of young people, and I was a younger person. I was considered a young person then. Maybe some of you still consider me young, right? If I told you my age, the young people would be thinking, man, that guy's old. Did he know Noah, right? And the older people think, no, that guy's young. But anyways, I'm feeling like I'm getting older. But um, so I was with a group of young people. And we were studying the topic of heaven in the Bible. And we went around the the little circle, and we we did one of those icebreaker questions, and everybody was sharing, what are they looking forward to most about heaven? One of my friends, Larry, he was in the group, and Larry is one one of of these guys who has these really thick glasses. Now, I'm not telling this to belittle him anyway, because this kind of gives you the context of the story. Really thick glasses, so much so that they kind of magnify his eyes. And so Larry was telling us when it came to his turn, he said, you know, he said, you see these glasses right here? He said, my entire life I've been made fun of when I was in school about these glasses. And he was a, a single parent uh, in a single parent home, and uh, he liked to play little sports. And he said, I was always the kid who had the tape in the corner, and my mom could never afford to fix my glasses. And he talked about what a burden those glasses were. But he said, at the coming of Christ, when he gets his new body, he said, I'm going to peel those glasses up off my face like this, and I'm going to fold them up like that. And he says, I'm going to throw those things as far away from me as I possibly can. You know why? Because Larry's not going to need those glasses anymore. He's going to have perfect vision. And at the coming of Christ, my friends, there's going to be no more crutches, no more wheelchairs, no more toothaches, no more eyeglasses, no more of any of that. Can you say amen there, everybody? And that's the great hope. That's what we're longing for. All right, so 
those are kind of the five things the Bible tells us about the nature of the coming of Christ. Now, let me answer some questions that perhaps you have about this whole scenario of the coming of Christ. The first question I want to answer is, but didn't Jesus say he was coming as a thief? And the answer is, yes, he did say that. But what did he mean by that, saying he was coming as a thief? Now, first of all, I want to share with you this powerful verse in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. Now, if you read the context of this verse, it is the sixth plague, okay? So in other words, five or six of the plagues have already fallen, and then notice what the Bible says here. Behold, I am coming as a what, everybody? A thief. So Christ hasn't even come yet. Now, don't miss this, because this model here that you see in those books and on TBN and all of them, they teach there's a rapture, Christ comes as a thief, right? But then they teach that the plagues come later on. But the Bible says here that Christ hasn't even come as a thief, and six of the plagues have already fallen. This one verse right here just blows a major hole in that whole theology that millions and millions of well-meaning, beautiful Christians believe, right? So uh, here's the, another verse. We looked at this one already, but I want to read it to you again. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. So what did it mean when Christ said he was coming as a thief? Well, here's the actual verse. It's verse 36 when Christ said it. He said, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. And then he goes on, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Now, let me ask you this before I give you the next verse. How many of you have ever had a thief come to their home? Anybody ever had that happen to them before? Isn't it a kind of a just a demoralizing experience? Two times in my life have I had a thief come to my home. Both times I was in college. I'll tell you about one of them. Uh, I had just recently become a Christian, given my heart to the Lord, and I lived with uh, five other guys who hadn't given their heart to the Lord, and they were wild like I was before, my BC days, right? And so they were all, it was a Friday night, they were all out partying and drinking like I used to, would have been doing. And so, but it was around 2 o'clock in the morning, and I just woke up. I don't know what woke me up, but I was thirsty. And so I walked out into the, uh, the kitchen, in our apartment, the kitchen was right here, and then the entrance to the door, our apartment, was right there, the door was. And so I'm sitting there drinking my glass of water like this, and all of a sudden the door opens up, and the guy behind the door goes like this. He opens it up, he goes, and then he slams the door. Now, in my BC days, my before Christ days, I had stumbled into a wrong apartment or two uh, a, a few times myself. And so I didn't think anything of it, so I went back to bed. Well, about an hour later, one of my roommates comes home, and he begins to scream, what happened to my stuff? And I leaped out of bed and I saw his speakers, his DVD player, which just had came out then, his television, it was all gone except for one speaker. And I realized what had happened. That thief was coming back to get that last speaker and when he saw me, and that's why he did what he did at the door. But you know what's interesting about that scenario, that thief coming to our, our apartment? He did not send a note in the mail to us that said, hey, listen, I'm going to be stopping by Friday night around 1, 2 o'clock, leave the lights on, and if you don't mind, unplug all the equipment and unhook it so it's easy for me to steal it. He did not do that. Thieves come when you're not expecting it. And what Christ is saying here, he's kind of giving a little bit of a warning here, and he's saying, look, be ready at all times, because I'm going to come at an hour when the world is not expecting. As a matter of fact, he says this in verse 44, therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. It doesn't mean he's going to sneak into town and just kind of grab this one and grab this one and take off. No, it's going to be a surprise, like a thief to the unprepared. That's what the scriptures is teaching there. So the second coming is a surprise to the unprepared. That's what it means when Christ said he's coming as a thief. Everybody understand that? Pretty crystal clear. All right, let's go to the next one. Do those left behind have a second chance at salvation? Now, I've been told multiple times by people who believe in this rapture followed by the seven-year period that they say, you know what, I'm not really serious about Christ right now, but when that rapture takes place, I know i got about three and a half years to get it right, and I'm going to take Christ serious then. I'm telling you, that is a, a common belief, particularly amongst young people who believe this. Now, let's see what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 13, verse 49. It says, The angels will come forth, and they'll separate the wicked from among the just. All right, that's verse 49. So you remember the angels come forth. They're going to separate the wicked from among the just. And then verse 50 says, And cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. 
Does that sound like there's a second chance? Yes or no, everybody? No, it does not. Now, here is Luke 17, and I want you to notice what Christ says. He uses a little illustration here from the Old Testament. As it was in the days of Noah, that's the Greek word to say Noah, so shall it also be in the days when the Son of Man is revealed. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So what is Christ saying here? He's saying that when Noah and his family got on the ark and the door was shut, that was it. That signified two classes right there. One was saved, one and was lost. When Lot and his family walked out of Sodom, that was it. One group was saved and one group was lost. And what Christ is saying here is that when he comes back, there's two groups. There's going to be one class that's saved and one class is, that is lost. So here's the point, my friend. There's no second opportunities when Christ comes. The time to get serious about our salvation is right now. Can you say amen to that, everybody? And my prayer is that nobody will walk away from this seminar or even tonight without committing themselves to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can you say amen, everybody? All right, now let me ask you this question, or let's answer this question. This is very important when people have this. What about the expression, one will be taken and the other left? That's where they get the little phrase, the left behind series from. Well, it's found in Luke chapter 17, and let's just read this little story. It's really quite simple, actually, this little parable that Christ tells. He says, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now, here's the question I have for you. We're going to talk about the one taken here in just a moment. But where's the one left at? Where's the one left at in the context of this story? He's in the bed, right? We know he's left in the bed. There's two men in one bed. One is taken, the other is left. He's left in the bed. Okay, Jesus goes on. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. My question to you right now is where's the other one left at? She's left there grinding, okay? Okay, then it goes on. Two men shall be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. Where's the guy left at? He's left in the field, okay? Now notice the question the disciples asked Jesus here in verse 34. And they answered and said unto Jesus, Where, Lord? Now, you see what the questions they're asking him? They're asking him, Where are they taken? They're not asking him, Where are they left? Because it's very clear the man's left in the bed, the woman's grinding, the other man's left in the field. So the question they're asking him is, Where are these people taken to? And Christ goes on. This is the King James. I'll put it in a modern translation in just a moment, but notice what it says. And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. So here's a more modern translation. It says, The disciples asked him, Where, Lord? Where are they taken? Jesus answered, Wherever there is a dead body, the vultures will gather. So what Christ is t saying here is that when he comes back, he takes people to destruction. Now you're thinking, well, what about the people who are saved? Hold on to your hats, okay? So everybody got that? He's asking, Where are they taken to? They're taken to where there's going to be dead bodies and vultures gathering. That's where they're taken. Okay, now let me back this up with a couple other scriptures. Now I'm going to save my home run passage for a minute. So this one just kind of puts a little bit of an exclamation point. Then I'm going to put a big exclamation point out in just a second. So here's the parallel passage of Luke 17. It's Matthew 24. Jesus tells a very similar passage here, or a parable here. For as in the days before the flood, <clears throat> they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and he did not know until the flood came and, what's that next word, everybody? Took them all away. So you see the context of the story? The flood comes and it takes them all away. Now, who did the flood take away? The good ones or the bad ones? The bad ones. Okay, so now he goes on. So also will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. All right, now let me put this very plainly to you. This is so clear. Jesus' is prob Jesus is most famous parable, perhaps, is the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now you tell me, which are the good ones, the wheat or the tares? The wheat are the good ones, right? We want to be wheat. We don't want to be tares. So here's the parable in Matthew chapter 13. He says, let both the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, which is the coming of Christ, I will say to the reapers, which are the angels we're going to see. Okay, so let me read this again. I don't want to bog you down with too much of interjecting. Let both grow together until the time of the harvest. At the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, what's that next word, everybody? First gather together the tares. The angels come, and the first thing they do is they gather together the tares. 
okay, the rebellious ones. And they bind them in bundles to burn them later on, but they gather the wheat into my barn. Now, the disciples were like me sometimes. I'm like, Lord, I just don't understand it. Please help me understand this. In verse 40, Jesus clears it up. So it will be at the end of this age or the end of the world, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will first gather out of his kingdoms all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Then, once those people are taken out of the way, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So here's the point. The wicked are taken first. Then the righteous are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So this idea that, hey, one is taken off the glory, the other one is left behind for a seven-year period, they've got that thing completely backwards. Okay, the ones who are taken are taken to destruction. The ones left behind after they're taken, they're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, all right, let's go on. Very important question here. Does the Antichrist come before or after the second coming of Christ? Does the Antichrist come before or like this model teaches right here, the rapture takes place and then the Antichrist comes? As a matter of fact, uh, a few years ago, I was at the library, my local library, and uh, I saw a DVD uh, by one of these prominent fellows who teaches about rapture seven-year period. I thought, you know what? I'm open-minded to listen to what this guy has to say. I checked that DVD out DVD, uh, and watched it. And what he said was, hey, you know, we as Christians, we can kind of guess who the Antichrist power is going to be, but we really don't need to know that because we're going to be taken off to heaven anyway, so we don't have to worry about it. And I thought, oh, my, 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 my. Christians believe this when the Antichrist is alive and well right now. Now, I want you to notice what the Word of God says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> now, 2 Thessalonians is a book that clears up a lot about the coming of Christ. Now, notice how powerful this is. Paul says, let no one, what's that next word, everybody? Deceive you by any means. Pause right there. Whenever Paul writes, let no one deceive you on something, you know what that means, everybody? That the Holy Spirit inspired him to write that because someone's going to try to deceive you on something. So that is what it's saying here. Someone's going to try to deceive you on this, but don't be deceived. What? What's going to, somebody going to deceive us on? He says, for that day, now this is the New King James, and when capital D is capitalized, it's talking about the coming of Christ. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The Greek word there is the apostasy comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What does this say here? The Antichrist comes first before the coming of Christ. But what millions and millions and millions of people are believing is that Christians are going to be whisked out of the way. They don't even have to worry about the Antichrist. Do you see how this teaching is really dangerous? Okay, let's go on. Now, where did this teaching come from? You know, it's very important oftentimes to find the origin of something. And, you know, everything has a beginning and an ending to it except God. Did you know that? And it's very fascinating. You know, I was just, uh, <clears throat> I got to, I like Ken Burns, Ken Burns history. Anybody else into Ken Burns besides me? I love his history. And I just bought the baseball history thing. And I was watching it the other day. And it showed the beginning of the National League and the American League. And I was so surprised by that because, of course, I've been following baseball for a long time, and I didn't really get how they had a beginning. Everything's got a beginning to it except for God. And where did this teaching then come from? Now, let me share with you how it came to the Christian church. Well, let me give you a little church history first. There's a younger picture of me, and this is the Wartburg Castle in Germany. And when Luther got himself in trouble with the great church that he loved, and he was a dead man walking, and so his friends took him, hit him in this castle. He grew a beard. He changed his name to George. And actually, all over Germany, everybody was wondering where Martin Luther was. And Luther, here he is. He's claiming to be this knight by the name of George. And he's going down, and he's having conversation with people. And he's like, yeah, where do you think Martin Luther's hanging out? And all the time, it was him in the Wartburg Castle. Well, Luther was a little depressed there, and so he decided to use his time wisely. And in this spot right here, Luther translated the New Testament into German. All right? So the Bible's in Latin before that, and very few people had that. And so now he translates the New Testament into German. Well, a fellow German by the name of Gutenberg, a few, century, a few decades earlier, had invented this thing. What is this thing called, everybody? The printing press, right? And so when Luther's got his New Testament, later he did the Old Testament, he's got his New Testament ready. Up in England, uh, Tyndale had gotten the, 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 the Bible translated into English, and now you have the printing press. And so the Bible now is being printed, and the Bible now is back in the hands of the people for the first time in hundreds and hundreds of years. And so now all these superstitious practices that were being done, they were all now being exposed when the light from the Word of God had come. 
And a lot of people were leaving the medieval church, okay? And so the, the church, the Catholic church, launched what is known in history as the Counter-Reformation. You see, a lot of people were thinking, well, what in the world's wrong with the church? And then they were seeing that this is definitely the Antichrist power. So a lot of people were leaving it. So the church of Rome decided to do something. They commissioned this fellow right here by the name of Francisco Ribera. They said, hey, listen, go into the prophecies and to develop an alternative uh, type of interpretation of who the Antichrist power is, because so many people are saying it's the papacy. So notice, this, notice what it says here in uh, Wikipedia. Now I can give you the original source here because I've read the book. It's called Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers where it shows how this came into the, the church. But notice what it says here. In order to remove the Catholic Church from consideration as the Antichrist power. So that was his goal. That was his objective as he tried to develop an interpretation. Ribera proposed that the first few chapters of the book of Revelation applied to ancient pagan Rome, and the rest he limited to a yet future period of three and a half literal years immediately prior to the coming of Christ. So you see, this is not exactly what people believe today, but this is the seed right here. Nobody believed it before, and this is where it came into the Christian church. Now this laid on the shelves because the great Protestants who are Bible students, they looked at this and said, ah, that's not biblical. But then enter into the scene John Nelson Darby. Now, John Nelson Darby, let me just share something about him. When this man was alive and he was preaching and he was promoting his ideas, key leaders during his day condemned his teachings. Like who? Like the great Charles Spurgeon. And does anybody know who George Mueller is, the guy who with the orphanage and all that? That man condemned his teachings also. They knew they weren't biblical. But now the vast majority of the world accept it. But notice what it says here. A nation holds that it will last seven years in all, being the last of Daniel's prophecies of 70 weeks. Now notice this point. This viewpoint was, what's that next word, everybody? First made popular by John Nelson Darby in the 19th century and was recently popularized by Hal Lindsey in the late great planet Earth. See what it's saying here? This was the first guy to develop this. Rapture seven-year period. It wasn't in the church before that. The great reformers didn't see it. The early Christians didn't see it that way. All right, now the last key player in this is C.I. Schofield. Anybody ever heard of C.I. Schofield before? One of the first Bibles that was given to me was the Schofield Bible, and I really appreciate it. You know, it's got some very helpful things. And what Schofield did was something that is very unique. Now, I'm not sure if he was the first one who did this. I'm not, uh, I haven't verified that. But he was at least one of the first who developed what was called a study Bible. And I love study Bibles. You get the biblical passage there, and then they'll have some great, sometimes scholarly notes or by somebody who knows the Bible well to help you understand the Bible. So Schofield develops this study Bible, perhaps the first one. Now, if you're going to the bookstore and you see, wow, there's a study Bible, people are buying these Bibles like hotcakes. And what he did is he laced it with dispensational theology and this idea that there's a rapture seven-year period. All of that is in here. So for generation after generation after generation, people bought this Bible, they read the Bible, they look at its notes, and now the vast majority of Christians believe in this teaching right here when it simply does not hold up to the biblical test. And if you look at all these men who teach Bible prophecy, and by the way, many of them have become millionaires off of this, all of them now believe in some form of this teaching, rapture, seven-year period, when simply it is not in the Word of God. And I say that very humbly, okay? Now, this is a most dangerous teaching. Why? Because I want you to notice what the Scripture says here in Revelation 14, 9, and 10. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. Now, remember what the Greek word for loud voice is again, everybody? Megaphone, the megaphone. So God wants this to be proclaimed in a very loud and clear way. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. But you see the problem? If Christians believe that they don't need to worry about these passages because they're going to be off in heaven, then they could be more susceptible to receive this and be deceived by this. Okay? So yes, it's very important. It's a very serious issue. So what did the left behind and this theology leave behind? You know, it's a fascinating story, made a lot of money for certain people, but it's left behind the Word of God, my friends, and that is the truth of the matter. Now, I'm going to conclude on a little encouraging note here. I want you to notice what Jesus said here, these verses. I'm sure you've got to memorize, as I do. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know, uh, so Christ has gone to prepare a place for you and I. Let me just share with you something from my own personal life of, of preparation. 
when my wife and I got married, shortly after we got married, she got pregnant. And my wife, once she got pregnant, I could just see instantly she was born to be a mom. Okay? My wife just loves being a mother, etc. And so she, you know, she got pregnant and she would talk about it. When we found out we were going to have a little girl, we'd stay up you know, late talking about what name. And my wife would tell me these long stories about how she was going to have her room and what she was going to do and what she was all going to do with our daughter. And she was preparing for that. She was reading the books that talked about how to have a good baby and how to raise your kids, etc. She was preparing. Well, when my wife was giving birth, And, of course, many of you have experienced that before. It's a very intense moment, right? And my wife was pushing so, so hard that her face went from red to purple to blood vessels bulging. And there was a moment where I thought her eyeballs were just going to pop out her head. It was very intense. Now, I'm trying to coach her on, you know, and being as encouraging as I am. But I'm also taking a peek to see how far along she is. And you know that moment where the baby, where you can just see the top of its head? And I'm thinking to myself, well, how is this baby even breathing? Come on, you big wimp, push. No, I wouldn't do that. I was, uh, I was encouraging her. But, you know, she's pushing, she's pushing, she's pushing. And she became so exhausted. And uh, there was a moment where I looked down in my wife's eyes, and she looked up at me. And I saw a look of determination in my wife's eye that I've never seen before. She was going to have this baby even if it killed her. I could see that look in her face. You know why? Because she'd been preparing for it. She wanted to have it. And the Bible says that Christ has gone to prepare a place for you and I. He's done everything possible to get us there. He's died for your and my sins. By receiving that, we can get the ticket. But there's an enemy of your souls, my friends, and he is going to do anything he can to keep you from that. He's going to deceive you. He's going to discourage you. He's going to do whatever he can do to keep you from being there in that day. And I I don't know about you, but I want to hear those words one day when Christ throws open those doors and he says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I want to be there. Don't you want to be there, everybody? All right. Well, God bless you all. Come back tomorrow night for a biggie. You don't want to miss tomorrow night. Revelation's last trumpet. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the blessed hope of Christ's coming. And Lord, we know that 2,000 years ago, the devil deceived the whole world in the coming of Christ. They misunderstood the prophecies, and we can see the same thing is happening right now. Father, we don't want to be deceived on this issue. We love Jesus. We love his word. And we want to be there, dear God, on that day when Christ comes back. And so, Father, help us be committed to that and help us just walk with him each step of the way, regardless of where he leads us, we pray in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say amen. Thanks for coming.